points in history, and tonight we're talking about the coronation of Charlemagne. So Charlemagne was born in about 742 AD, to, and he was the son of uh, Bertrada and Pepin the Short. Uh, Pepin became the king of the Franks in 751. Actually, Charlemagne was actually born before the canonical marriage of his parents. In other words, they hadn't converted yet to uh, Catholicism and weren't married in the church yet. His exact birthplace is not known, uh, but some suggest that it could be either in Aachen or in Liege, uh, but it's definitely somewhere in modern-day Germany. His, uh, his, this future ruler's childhood and education, uh, we, we don't really know much about it, but what we do know is that he had an affinity for it. He, uh, he liked the idea of him being educated, but he also liked uh, those that were around him and those that worked for him to be educated. After Pippin's uh, death, or Pippin uh, the Short's death in 768, the Frankish kingdom uh, became divided between Charlemagne and his brother uh, Carloman. Now, you can only imagine that brothers would fight over what the parents give them. Uh, 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 Carloman actually had the exteriors of the empire at the time. Uh, I'm sorry, the interior of, uh, of, of the uh, kingdom at the time. And Charlemagne actually was uh, tasked with uh, the border areas. Yes? Was he just Charles before later became Charles the Great? Or was he born Charlemagne? Uh, he was born Charles. He's going to be, uh, uh, I think that what we'll learn is because of his stature uh, and his uh, prowess on the battlefield, he was something like uh, his, if you, if you multiply the length of his foot by seven, he was that tall. So he was something like anywhere between six foot five and six foot eight uh, inches tall. He was a big, big guy. So uh, he actually... Uh, they had strained relationships. Eventually, uh, he is going to get control of, of the full kingdom. Now, as, I was, uh, as we just mentioned, uh, Char Charlemagne was large and tall. Uh, and the upper part of his head was round. His eyes were large and animated. He, has a, he had a long nose, a hairy face, uh, and he was a lot of time very jovial. His uh, appearance was stately and dignified, uh, whether he was sitting or standing. His neck was thick, somewhat short. His belly was prominent. Uh, in fact, what uh, one thing I read was he really liked to eat. So, but the symmetry of the rest of his body concealed his defects. His walk was firm, his uh, carriage manly, his voice was clear, uh, but his voice was also surprisingly thin. It wasn't a strong, it was a strong voice, but not overly strong. Just kind of a little picture of uh, one of the many paintings of Charlemagne. So Charlemagne's rule. First of all, as uh, if your name's Charlemagne or, or Charles the Great, uh, you're going to suppose that he is a powerful guy. And so he was a tremendously powerful emperor. His empire was large, it was not easy to rule, but Charlemagne was smart. And he actually started making changes to uh, his government to make it more efficient and more effective. Uh, he established a permanent capital in Aachen, which is now in Germany, but he also had other spots that he liked to go to. And so he had at least two main palaces, but liked to live in many different areas. Uh, he, and when I say he was smart, he was good about delegating authority. Uh, he, uh, as, as I said, built palaces that were large to reflect his greatness, but he chose counts, officials, to help rule parts of the empire uh, in his name. 
Typically, if you were good on the battlefield and you were a good leader of men and you won a big battle for him, he would assign you a territory to rule over. Uh, in fact, the way he actually started setting up the various territories these men had uh, was the, uh, the foundation for the feudal system that Europe goes into uh, in that period. So the, the counts uh, bound to obey, granted, uh, they had large tracts of land uh, and they were given a lot of authority. Now, when I say he was smart, he really was smart because he gave these large uh, uh, resources to these counts, but he also had inspectors that went out to check on them, hire good people, pay them a good wage, and check them. Those are the, the rules of business. And he actually uh, did that. He hired these people basically by saying, this is yours, but then he would have someone that would come around and audit them. <clears throat> Charlemagne instituted what is called the uh, Carlegian uh, dynasty or uh, renaissance that came about during uh, his uh, time that he was a leader. Uh, he actually instituted changes in four different areas. In education, uh, he was personally interested in, in, in learning, but he also ordered churches to start teaching the peasants uh, how to read, how to write, and he also used the monasteries to uh, and the monks to start teaching people uh, so that they would be educated. Uh, as far as scholars, he sent copies of texts to the monasteries uh, so that they would have a larger library, a greater library of all the classics. And so uh, some of the monks that were in these monasteries, uh, monasteries would have to spend all their time uh, being scribes, copying uh, material. Now, one of the advantages or one of the great things about this is that there are many valuable uh, uh, manuscripts that have been handed down to us today uh, because of his will to have more people to have these manuscripts. Uh, Charlemagne was one of the first uh, developers of a legal code. Uh, and incorporated legal laws. And I think that basically you can understand it if people were doing a specific thing that was bad for the local group of people, they would come up with what they called diplomas, or they would give uh, new codes, and then you would have code enforcers that would uh, keep the peace in the area. Uh, religion, he wanted to preserve Christian uh, teaching and he created a unified empire. And he had basically a motto uh, for the people that were under him, which is kind of interesting, convert or die. You had a choice. You could believe or you could die. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. He sent his monks, the monks in these monasteries, out proclaiming the message of the gospel to more and more people. Just to get an idea of the, uh, the world at that time and the extent of Christianity, I don't know if you'll, you're able to see it on there, but anywhere you see uh, a, a line, those are the areas where uh, Islam is. But in the pink areas, uh, are, are areas that became Christianized uh, because of the Frankish influence. <clears throat> so how did, how did uh, Charlemagne actually become someone who was not only a king, but an emperor in the Holy Roman Empire? Well, in 799, Pope Leo III was assaulted by some of the Romans that thought he was an incapable pope. In fact, they uh, disliked him so much, they tried to pull his eyes out of the sockets, and they tried to cut his tongue out. 
their thinking there was if he can't see and he can't talk, then he can't be Pope. However, he did escape and he found Charlemagne. And Charlemagne's advisors told him it would be a good idea for him to take a bunch of soldiers to Rome and reestablish Leo as the Pope. <clears throat> Now, the oath of, the oath of uh, purgation of Pope Leo III uh, is simply that as, as Leo is wanting to go back into power, he actually is going to swear about his innocence. He is going to purge his sins before uh, the people and let the people know that he is a capable pope and a good spiritual leader for them. And so he swore an oath in order to affirm his innocence of any crimes that were attributed to him by his enemies. Now, what we see happening here is this is like two days before Charlemagne becomes the next or, or becomes the emperor. So it, it, it looks like that what happened in history is these two were in collusion trying to make the big event happen. So Pope Leo III gave Charlemagne a new title in order that the Frank might use his imperial power to chastise the papal enemies. Hmm. Things are going on in and around and under the table. So... <clears throat> Here is just uh, some of the, uh, a picture of some of the, uh, the things. This is Charlemagne's chapel. One of the things that Charlemagne did that was different than most kings of the period is he worshipped <clears throat> one to two times a day. Uh, he, he loved hearing scripture uh, spoke about. He loved uh, singing. He, lo he loved the psalms. And so for a few hours every day in the morning and in the evening, uh, everyone that was associated uh, with the palace would have to go and worship at that time. And to the right there is a picture of his, uh, his throne, his uh, seat that is held in high esteem there. This is a, a, a <clears throat> medieval uh, drawing of what it may have looked like when uh, Charlemagne received uh, his crown, the crowning of Charlemagne. And this is just a more colorized uh, version of that same thing. So <clears throat> Charlemagne's coronation as emperor was intended to represent the continuation of an unbroken line of emperors in the Roman Empire from Augustus to Constantine the Fourth. I'm sorry, Constantine the Sixth. But what it actually ended up having, it's not a, a continuation because one of the little problems, the little hiccups that's going on in the background around the same time is that Constantine VI is still alive uh, and is claiming to be emperor. In fact, he's co-emperor with Irene, his mother. And uh, I don't know if you understand, but if you have a group over here that uh, is the eastern section of the Roman Empire, and to this point, they have been considering themselves the real Roman Empire, and now we have someone else that is making claim to the leadership. Didn't they get chased out? <clears throat> she actually gets chased out by Constantine the Sixth, and then two years later, he brings her back and then a year after that, he actually, she actually puts his eyes out, cuts his tongues out, and takes him to a monastery. So, but here's the, here's the thing with Charlemagne. Charlemagne has no interest in the eastern section of the uh, Roman Empire of that period. What he wants to do is establish the Western Empire as the power, and he is not, the theological differences uh, between the two are such that he doesn't want to fight those battles. He wants to affirm uh, the Western Roman Empire. 
It'll be about 1045, 1045 AD, when the Great Schism happens, when the battle finally happens uh, between the two. And I believe Nick's going to talk to that. I don't know if it's next week or, or soon. So Charlemagne, he comes in, uh, he has already been in office for uh, 25, 30 years at this particular time in 800. But once he is now the emperor, he makes the decision to unite all the Germanic people uh, into one kingdom and convert everybody to Christianity. And so what he spends the majority of his time doing is fighting battles. Might makes right. Uh, the, the, you know, the, talk about fear and intimidation. Uh, that was his philosophy of bringing people to Jesus. Literally, he would put a sword in your face and give you a come to Jesus meeting. So soon after becoming the king, he conquered the Lombards, the Avars, uh, and he conquered Bavaria. He waged a bloody three-decade long battle against the Saxons, uh, who were a tribe of uh, pagan worshipers, and earned his, his, his uh, reputation of ruthlessness with them. You see, in 782, at the Massacre of Verdun, Charlemagne ordered 4,500 Saxons to convert. And when they said no, all in one day, he took off all of their heads. So he eventually forced the Saxons to convert to Christianity and declared that anyone who didn't get baptized or follow the other, uh, follow Christian traditions would be put to death. Some would say that was a little harsh. I would have to tend to agree. This, uh, I don't, this, I don't remember that being in the Beatitudes. <laughs> blessed or, well, it, it just assumes that you'll keep your head on. <laughs> wow, yes. It's not, I, I don't think it's in the Beatitudes, is it? Blessed are they who sever on the yeah, sever the heads of their enemies. Yeah, that's, that's a specific be. foundation of the strength of the Catholic Church today. So as emperor, he was a zealous defender of Christianity. He gave money and land to the Christian church, and he protected the popes. To acknowledge his power and reinforce the relationship with the church, uh, Pope Leo crowned Charlemagne as emperor on Christmas Day, 800, at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Uh, when, when he actually, Charlemagne didn't know it was happening, but supposedly, but as he bent over to pray a prayer for uh, his kingdom, Leo came and crowned him at that time. So as emperor, he proved to be a talented diplomat, uh, an able administrator uh, of this vast area that he controlled. He promoted education, encouraged uh, the, the Carolingian Renaissance, a period of renewed emphasis in scholarship and culture. He also instituted economic reforms and was a driving force behind uh, the Carolingian minuscule, which is a standard time, uh, side uh, way to write uh, and Actually, this ended up being the basis for most European countries' uh, alphabets. Here in a while, we'll, we'll actually show you a copy of a, a Carolingian uh, minuscule. So he ruled from a number of cities and palaces, but he spent most of his time in, in Aiken. His palace there included a school, and he recruited the best teachers in the land to teach in that particular school. He was also interested in athletics. He was highly energetic. Uh, energetic. He enjoyed hunting, horseback riding, and swimming. But his, his appeal for Aiken was that it was a place of hot springs. If you're going to have a place that you want to live, why not have a therapeutic spring uh, for you to saunter in and spend time in? 
So Charlemagne's family. He, uh, he married the daughter of uh, the Sidrus, the king of the Lombards, which, you know, that's, that's a, a, a way a lot of the families in Europe actually uh, would try to uh, align with other, other people and other rulers uh, to solidify their power. However, he, he married uh, her uh, because his mother told him to, but after a year, he divorced her and married Hildegard, uh, who was a, and I don't even know where Swabia is, but she was a Swabian noble. In his personal life, Charlemagne had multiple wives and mistresses, and perhaps as many as 18 children. Remember, uh, one, of the th one of his monikers is Charlemagne, the father of Europe. And single-handedly. Single-handedly. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the joke at that time was uh, most people probably were kin to him because he had so many children out there uh, after all these conquests. But, it, you know, he was also a, a devoted father who encouraged his children's education. He loved his daughter so much that he prohibited them, them from marrying while he was alive. One of his daughters actually was uh, <clears throat> engaged to uh, one of the members of the Constant, uh, Constantine's family. And up to the time of the wedding, it looked like things were going to solidify between the East and the West. But at the last minute, Irene saw that they could, her and Constantine VI could lose power, and she called off the wedding. <clears throat> As writers uh, who uh, are... Uh, paid by different families, there is some argument over who called off the wedding. <clears throat> he had three sons, Charles, Pepin, and Louis, three daughters, uh, uh, man, I can't even say that one, but Ruadrid, Bertha, and Gesellia. Uh, he had uh, three other daughters, two by his second wife, a German woman, a third by a concubine, a concubine who, who does, uh, well, whose name, excuse me, the writer uh, of this couldn't remember the name of the woman. But at, at the death of Festrata, he married Lichigard, an uh, Almaniac woman who bore him no children. And after her death, he had three concubines who bore him more sons. He wanted people to become Christians, but he didn't want to follow the Christian way. <laughs> well, he wanted he wanted it his way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, as far as public works, he also started uh, many public works to adorn and benefit his kingdom. Uh, he had uh, the greatest of was the Church of the Holy Mother of God at uh, I La Chapelle, and he actually built a very uh, impressive bridge over the Rhine in Mayence. The only problem with that is it was made out of wood and it was destroyed by fire. And so he, he built a lot of great buildings in the area that he actually uh, was. He also had two uh, beautiful places or palaces, uh, one at Ingelheim and one at uh, Nijemagen. I can't even say these, uh, these words. Nijemagen. Nijemagen. Nijmegen, there you go. The Netherlands. <clears throat> and whenever he found them falling into disrepair, that is, the buildings in the kingdom, he would invest in building these, uh, these cities' buildings to bring them back up to code. <clears throat> he also outfitted a naval fleet to protect Gaul and Germany from the Vikings and Italy from the Moors. So he was a quite busy guy. If there's a big point in all of this, <clears throat> in trying to understand the significance of Charlemagne and the turning point in history, this is going to be it. The combination of church and state. You see, Charlemagne proposed reforms in the church, made changes to liturgy, and raised standards and requirements for monasteries and monks. <clears throat> Now, catch this. Notice all those things. What do all those things sound like? The work of 
what institution? The church. The church. Okay, so he's proposing reforms to the church, but he is the secular leader. And the issue is, is that all of a sudden by having Charlemagne, who's interested in Christianity, uh, become this leader uh, or, or the emperor, he now is, is going to start uh, crashing into things that are for the church. He's going to start imposing things uh, that are going to uh, deteriorate the, the power of the Pope and increase the power of him, the emperor. So his desire to strengthen the church uh, by both inner reform and expansion, send armies to conquer other lands, force the conversion of conquered people, uh, as we've talked about. At the time, the church and state were, are combined. And all of a sudden, uh, because Leo III <clears throat> liked his eyes and his tongue, uh, he is agreeable to Charlemagne. Charlemagne was quite successful in combining the church, uh, and the Holy Roman Empire held sway over millions of people during the Middle Ages. But not until the Protestant Reformation was the total uh, totalitarian power of the church finally broken. <clears throat> Most of the stuff that I've been reading to you uh, comes from a man by the name of Einhard. Einhard is, uh, according to Einhard, Charlemagne was in good health until the final four years of his life uh, when he often suffered fevers and acquired a limp. The, the, bi the biographer Einhard notes this, even at this time, he followed his own counsel rather than the advice of doctors. Can't imagine a man doing that. <laughs> Whom he uh, uh, nearly, uh, he very nearly hated because they advised him to give up roasted meat. They were asking him to give up barbecue. Roasted meat, which he loved, and to restrict himself from boiled meat. So, Charlemagne, is uh, health is declining. Things are going downhill for him. Uh, he realizes it in 813, he crowns his son, Louis the Pious, uh, the king of Aquitaine, uh, as co-emperor. So his, his son is the king of Aquitaine, which is a, a small area, and he has excelled at it. Uh, and rather than his other two sons uh, coming into power, he chooses uh, Louis the Pious to be the successor uh, emperor to, the, uh, to this empire. So at the time of his death, his empire encompassed such a much of Western Europe. Charlemagne was buried at a cathedral in Aachen, uh, and in the ensuing decades, his empire was died, divided up among his heirs. By the late 800s, uh, it was dissolved. Nevertheless, Charlemagne became a legendary figure uh, endowed with mythical qualities, and in 1165, under Frederick, uh, Emperor Frederick uh, Barbarossa, Charlemagne was canonized. Uh, in other words, he was made a saint for political reasons because the emperor who was part of the superstructure of the church could do that. However, the church does not recognize his sainthood today. Imagine that. <clears throat> if you do bad things and it is written down historically, it's going to catch up with you. So this is a picture of Charlemagne's empire in 800 AD. You can see that it was half of Italy and it went all the way up to the uh, France, uh, Netherlands coast. Uh, and you can see how far it spread both north and south. Lots of people. So what did he accomplish? What are the 10 major accomplishments of Charlemagne? First of all, he united most of Western Europe uh, through the power of his armies uh, and his ability to actually manage people. He, he actually had a, a large area of people that had basically one goal at the time. He was able to to lead them forward. Uh, <clears throat> he became the king of the Franks in 768. 
He led a series of campaigns throughout Western Europe, and he expanded the, the, the Frankish state, and he founded the Carolingian uh, Empire, which led to the Carolinian Renaissance. Second thing, he was the first uh, emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Remember, we had the Roman Empire that's cruising along, and somewhere in the five in the sixth century, uh, things go south, and instead of the Roman Empire being headquartered in Rome, it ended up being in Constantinople. Constantine had taken over the empire. And so everything uh, was moving east. Uh, and so here, when Leo, who had no real authority to name someone emperor, names him emperor, the shift in everything going off to the east, the flow stops. And, and things, things start to stabilize uh, for Western Europe. One of the things that he really loved, Charlemagne loved, was St. Uh, Peter's Basilica, which is where he was actually uh, crowned emperor. Uh, he only visited there three other times during his life, but he spent lots of money, spent lots of money there uh, for its upkeep and to keep it in beautiful condition. He, he played a vital role in the spread of Christianity across Europe. He was devoted to uh, Christianity and took uh, several steps to spread the religion across his vast empire. He gave money and land to Christian church uh, and protected the popes. He educated the clergy and improved their schools. He standardized liturgical practices. But most of all, I believe that what it doesn't say in the history books is that he used the power of the sword to convert the masses. Uh, the fear motivation is what he brought most of all to the table. Power trip. <laughs> now, he was the driving force behind the uh, uh, Carolingian uh, Renaissance. Uh, and what that, what that is, is that he, when he came into power, he brought an English uh, scholar by the name of Alcuin of York with him, and Alcuin uh, helped him learn about uh, grammar uh, and speaking and rhetoric and all these different things, and, and taught him about literature and art and architecture. So the Carolingian Renaissance uh, ended the... the cultural stagnation of the Dark Age, in, uh, which had marred Europe for centuries and laid the foundation for the rise of the Western civilization. So what has sparked the Western civilization, civilization which we actually are part of, uh, which our forebears actually were part of, uh, Charlemagne actually lit the fires that caused this civilization to, to unfurl. One of the things that he also did is he standardized uh, currency that improved the commerce of the region. He abolished a monetary system that was based on the gold standard, primarily because gold was just not available in the area. And so he set up a system based on silver uh, and was able to, he actually came up with uh, the liver, which is one pound of silver, Livre, uh, and it is divided into 20 sous, 12 denaires. This is the forerunner of all of the monetary systems of Europe, even until today. Yeah. And so he, he actually brought this to light to where you could actually have uh, open trade between people, and you're not just having to deal in ducks and chickens and rabbits and everything but you could actually uh, do it in currency. As far as architecture, he ordered the construction of the famous uh, Palatine Chapel in Aachen. Uh, it is a very 
uh, it's inspired early Christian uh, and Byzantine architecture. And remember, the Byzantine uh, Empire is the one that is located over in Constantinople. That's where Irene and uh, uh, Constantine the Sixth are uh, at the at the beginning of all this. And so this is the Aachen Chapel that he actually built. And this is it today. It's still, still standing. This is uh, uh, looking at, he actually had a lot of the columns and the granite and the marble brought from uh, Rome. He actually uh, tore down buildings in Rome to bring over uh, to this area for his chapel and to kind of get an idea of the inside of it. You can see the woman standing in the middle of it. You can see how, how big it is. And so he is considered the sponsor of medieval education. Uh, he, uh, he's the one that set up allowing the masses of the people to become educated. The masses up until this point were beaten down and were not allowed to be educated at all. No reading, no writing. Uh, they were only given the, the worst uh, of, of the jobs. He actually started trying to educate people and, and uh, allow for their intelligence to help uh, actually bolster the whole system. I promise that we would be able to look at a little bit of the minuscule, not that we could read it, but you can barely see it. But I think if Jack looks at it, he's going to, it, it looks a lot like what uh, the Greeks, like you can, a minuscule, what you're going to do is uh, instead of actually, like we would write down to a line, you would actually, a minuscule, you start at the top of the line and write down. That's how you actually drop down and your scribes know how far to come down so that there are spaces between. Typically, uh, so that they didn't waste parchment, they would actually line the paper very lightly beforehand so that they could have uh, a very set number of words and letters on a page. So this, this new script promoted and developed uh, a standard and again, part of that Renaissance led to the Italian Renaissance and eventually led to Latin literacy in the kingdom. But most of all, what he did was he maintained order and prosperity. That's what the Romans were good at was Pax Romana. What he was able to do once he went in and secured an area he was able to create an area that remained peaceful uh, and you didn't have the continual over, uh, over or turning, uh, turnover of, of leadership and continual wars that went through the area. 